Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. So one of the great things A.K. Ramanujan said is, when you hear a story as opposed to read it, the teller and the hearer are both part of a process. One of the nice things when you tell a story is people interrupt you and say, I think you got that wrong. Or do you really know what you're talking about? Because they think they know it better than you, and maybe they do. And I think that this is something of enormous significance. Because one of the things which happens in independent India is, and a great positive revolution, many people who never had property got it. You know, we think of women and the Hindu succession act. But think of tenant farmers and the great film, you know, I'm sorry I keep going back to Hindi films. But to me, one of the great films which was ever made was Do Bigha Zameen, Valraj Sani, who, you know, he dies at the end of the film. The other would, of course, be Mother India, which if you think about it, is of a farm family headed by a single woman. It's a 21st century film and, of course, it's played by the legendary Nargis. That the 20th century shapes our present and will influence our future is a common point of debate in India. Clearly, politics and economics, culture and society were deeply influenced, if not fundamentally shaped, by choices made at key points of time. Yet this applies equally so with even greater long-term consequences to the environment in its widest sense. In a more focused way, this is how human actions, via technological choices or the ways land or water are governed, influence the non-human entities we share spaces with. Rather than view ecology and society as two distinct entities, the overlaps and interfaces can shed fresh light on where we stand today. And knowing how we got to where we stand matters. India's recent environmental pasts have bearing not only on this country, but Asia and the world at large. In this episode of BIC Talks, Professor of History and Environmental Studies at Ashoka University, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan, delivers the first annual Vijay Tiruvadi Memorial Lecture that took place at the BIC premises in early January 2024. Vijay Tiruvadi was a naturalist, environmental historian, and a true blue Bangalorean who will be terribly missed by all those who knew him and all those who have walked Lal Bagh with him. Over to Mahesh. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here today. It's also a very poignant moment. You know, the year I was born, it's no great secret, 1964, saw the death of probably one of the most significant environmental thinkers, and I would say practitioners, of the 20th century, Rachel Carson. And uh, Rachel Carson was someone who spirit lived on in the walks of the late uh, Vijay Tiruvadi. I'm going to share with you a famous quote of hers, which says, those who dwell among the beauties and mysteries of the earth are never alone or weary of life. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. The more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe, the less taste we shall have for its destruction. I think, uncanny as it is, these words, appropriate as they were for her time and her place, and as I would think are appropriate for our time and our place, are perhaps even more apt for the life and the message of someone who, in a sense, invented and recreated a new life, not for himself, but for all those who were privileged enough to accompany him on his walks. I'm always struck by late Girish Karnat Sahib because there's something very fascinating in that short quote of his, where it said that he had been on this walk before, but it peeled off so many layers that he would never see the reality in quite the same way again. In a sense, that is the challenge for anyone who attempts to do a history. History, as we all know, is about stories. It's about stories of the past. As inevitably one gets asked by relatives, and I'm sure you will all be familiar with this, we live in a city and a country where studying medicine, engineering, mathematics, science, and so on is seen as the acme of perfection. And history is something which is something like a laggard in the, in the bush. So you're always asked, what kind of history do you study? Do you really know what happened? Can we really know what happened? How does it really matter whatever happened in the past? 
I'm afraid it does matter, not because the past necessarily shapes the present, but you cannot prepare for the future without having a sense of the past. Everybody has a sense of the past. We have memories, we have ideas, we have received wisdoms, we have things which we think are home truths. I think it was Keynes who once said that much of what we take to be common sense is but distilled prejudice. And this perhaps applies even more when we think of histories in relation not only to the human world, but to the environment. The 20th century was one like no other in world history. It was a time when, as we all know, the map of the world was unfurled and remade. Some would say unmade, I would use the term remade. At the dawn of the 20th century, there were great empires. You can remember them if you talk to any school child. There were many European empires that vanished by the end of the century. And the vanishing or the beginning of the vanishing of the British Empire in this part of the world in the late 1940s was one part of the process of that drawback of European domination, which had dominated much of the previous few centuries. Whether we begin with 1492 or 1767, depending which dates you want to pick. The other, of course, was the rise of new nation states. Uh, today, there are about four times the nation states as they were in 1914. There were 50, now there are nearly 200. I'm cheating a bit, there are 192. The other change, of course, is there are more people on the earth than they were. For every one person in 1900, there were four times as many by 2000. These are all well-known facts. What may not be quite widely known is something John McNeil tells us, that the world's economy grew 14-fold in that 100-year period. There was more wealth created in that 100 years than the previous 100 years, previous 1,000 years the previous 10,000 years or the previous 100,000 years. You can go backward in time. The creation of wealth went with something else, the creation of waste. Think of something very simple. I am lucky that I teach in a university as wonderful as Ashoka. And I think I am lucky that I teach in 8.30 a.m. class. Sentiment not shared, I assure you, by any of my students, maybe 1%. And I like asking them in the morning, what did you have for breakfast? People take this very literally and they give you an answer. I didn't eat anything or they tell you something. Now, whatever you had for breakfast or will have for dinner contains within itself a very important element, nitrogen. And for centuries, people tried to fix nitrogen in the soil or to increase the quantum of nitrogen available for a plant. Well, in 1908, there was a breakthrough. Like many breakthroughs in the modern world, it was made by two Germans, Haber and Bosch. And they came up with the synthesis of ammonia. And with the synthesis of ammonia, it became possible to increase the quantum of nitrogen you gave the plant in order to absorb. There were other changes. You are in a, a state where agricultural politics is important. I teach in a university in Haryana where agricultural politics is equally important. And other than the minimum support price, the price of NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, is an explosive political point. But what we perhaps do not tend to realize is that all the nitrogen that is applied for these plants doesn't get absorbed by the plants. Some stays on in the soil, much leaches into the groundwater, some ends up in the surface water. And one of the great transformations of the 20th century relates to the fact that petrochemical agriculture, which has enabled such large yields, so whatever you ate for breakfast and will eat for dinner, may have benefited from a dowsing of urea, just to illustrate the point. That very nitrogen, leaching in excess quantities into surface water bodies, has led to algal blooms in virtually every water body on Earth, which have deep consequences, not just for the water, but for the organisms that live within it. So the 20th century is one where humans began to have the capability to remake the world more profoundly than ever before. All humans didn't have equal power. Some had more than others. But one of the consequences of technology is that one, that the same technology, which confer benefits, in this case, better nutrition, the person who eats whatever it was, ragi modde or alu paratha or masal dosa, also has consequences for other life forms. And the consequences of technological transformation for life forms cannot be viewed in isolation from the material cycles. Think of something which makes uh, news everywhere today, the carbon cycle. I was just talking to a very bright student who said he wants to learn about climate change and he wants to know climate change economics. 
Now, whatever you do or do not know about climate change, there is at least one prominent politician on earth who has occupied a very powerful position and may occupy it soon, who thinks it's a Chinese hoax, barring a few such as him. I think we would all broadly agree that the pace of climate change has a lot to do with human action and the changes in the carbon cycle. When you think about the carbon cycle, uh, one of the consequences of it is that when the quantum of carbon in the atmosphere increases rapidly, the atmosphere becomes a heat sink. This is not a new fact. It was known widely enough in the mid-19th century for five British engineers and botanists and scientists based in this country, including Forbes Royal and one based in this city, the great uh, Hugh Francis Cleghorn, to write a, a note to the British Association for Advancement of Science, BAAS, yes, that's right, on the implications of tropical deforestation for global atmospheric change. Like a lot of wise reports, it was heard, it was read, it was filed away and forgotten. But what I think is important is that this increase of quantum, one of the factors driving it is the combustion of fossil fuels. When you stop to think about it, fossil fuels are a result of photosynthesis, similar to the plant which gave us the alu for the potato for the alu paratha or the wheat or the rice or what have you. The difference is that these materials had been compressed in the Mesozoic or Jurassic age and they are now being extracted and burnt. There's a remarkable book about to be published by a man called Mark Schutzer on India's fossil natural capital. And it shows the centrality of India in the fossil fuel transitions of the 19th century. A lot of it is about two coal fields, which have a murky as well as glorious chapters in India's long history, Charya and Rani Ganj. This is where coal mines went underground. You know, you went into the bowels of the earth, you got the coal out and you burnt it. And obviously the consequences are that um, it uh, has more calorific value per kilogram. Sorry to take you back to class 8 chemistry, but we can't escape class 8 chemistry when we think of 20th century history, can we? But the burning of that then releases much more nitrogen, sulfur, potassium, and carbon than the equivalent kilogram of biomass such as wood. So there are two ways in which you can see the enormous consequences of the changes in the nitrogen cycle and the changes in terms of the carbon cycle. Think of one big contrast between the India of 1900 and the India of 2000. The obvious contrast would be that India became independent in 1947. It acquired a constitution in 1952. It conducted elections. From around the 40s to now, India emerges in economic terms as, in, as a very major player in the world. But in environmental terms, Let's look at two very interesting things that happen, and they happen actually around the late 1960s. One is that for the first time, irrigation water was taken largely not from surface bodies, lakes, ponds, rivers, or even wells, but from tube wells. So in a country where in the 1960s, 70-80% of irrigation came from surface water, today 60% comes from groundwater. And this is the magic of the tube well. The tube well, remember, is powered not by cattle, animal muzzle power, not by humans, human muzzle power, but by fossil fuel drawn energy for the large part. This has huge implications. It changes not just the rate at which you extract water. It changes your ability to grow more crops in the same land, not once, but twice. It also enabled expansion of agriculture into many arid and semi-arid areas. It enabled you, in other words, to grow sugarcane in areas where sugarcane was never ever grown before. The other change is equally related. I was watching yesterday an old Manoj Kumar film, which has a very famous song, you know, Mere Desh Ki Dharti, Sona Ugle Ugle Hire Moti, Mere Desh Ki Dharti. Manoj Kumar, uh, invariably in these films, was named Bharat, which means India, in case you, you, you missed that. <laughs> and uh, he uh, plays a role of someone who tries to bring ethical behavior into his conduct. This is a particularly interesting song because uh, he's singing happily and merrily and there are people plowing fields and they're being plowed in the early scenes by oxen. If you recall as late as the 71 and 77 elections, the then dominant Congress party symbol was a plow yoked to two bullocks. So the bullock provided the traction power. Well, 
I have news for you. By the year 2000, 70% of the traction power was not provided at Bullocks, but by tractors. And it's very significant that the largest market for tractors in India is for small tractors. Because the average land holding size is small. 80% of holdings are below 1 hectare. And about 85% are below 2 hectare. So there's a huge transformation which takes place in the landscape. Looking at just two indicators, the energy that was used for plowing fields and for transport, it's fossil fuel energy, and the fertilizer that was used to raise yields, these were petrochemical fertilizers. I think that one of the fascinating things about India is that by the time India becomes independent, 1946, there'd been a very intensive debate, not only on its political future, what would the nature of the polity be? What should be the official link language? Should there be one or more than one? How should the boundaries of India be redrawn within and without? What should its relationship with the great powers of the world be? But among these is a very big debate, not about how to attain freedom, but what to do with that freedom once it was attained. And I think it can be said that many of the key figures who participated in these debates in the early 20th century were seized with issues which today we may be tempted to label as environment. Think of the very interesting debate, for instance, between Mahatma Gandhi and uh, his well-known pupil or disciple or follower, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, you know, in the late 1920s, uh, Gandhi writing to Saklatwala famously, and I paraphrase, wrote that it would be, he would be horrified if India, after independence, adopted the path England had taken. He said it would be the tiger stripes without the tiger. And if uh, 300 million people go down the path a small island nation has, it would strip the earth uh, like a pack of locusts, I unquote. Now, there is much that one can debate about Gandhi's worldview, his maximum program. But it's fascinating to note that his critique is of industrialization as a project per se. The idea, well known to all of you, that mass production is not the answer to poverty, but production by the masses emphasized that small units would lead to self-reliance of the individual, that the charkha, hand-woven, hand-spun cloth, would generate incomes and create a sense of material dignity, seemed especially apposite if one keeps in mind that spinning and weaving were taken up by people who were branded as low caste, and one should not forget a very large group, such a large group, with out property rights and access to literacy would also be empowered in some way. And I'm referring, of course, to women. So I think there was a lot of cultural, social, economic thought behind the project of the Charkha. But closely aligned with it was the notion, not articulated so much in his writings as by that of some of his erudite followers and practitioners, that there could be a different way of alleviating the problem of poverty material dignity, which is very central to him, I want to emphasize this, by emphasizing not only the dignity of labor, but what we would today call a choice of technology. This is not the terms they use, the term we are using. Prominent among them is, of course, a great son of what is now Karnataka, J.C. Kumarappa, who has been written about by many. Professor uh, Venu Govindu of the Indian Institute of Science has written a remarkable book about Kumarappa. And I will share with you something because seeing the attire all of us are using, you might find the story amusing. He reads Gandhi's works and he goes to a khadi shop and he doesn't know what to order because he was, uh, remember, a chartered accountant. And I believe chartered accountants then were even more naturally dressed than they are now. They wore a shirt, a coat and a tie because otherwise, you know, they won't be taken seriously by their clients. And uh, the person there was flabbergasted. He explained there is no size like that for kurta, pajama, dhoti. So he ordered 10 sets. And from then on to the end of his life, he only wore khadi. One of Kumarappa's great contributions was to study rural energy in great detail. And some of those studies are particularly interesting when one looks at carbon transition debates. Not that you may take what he prescribed then and do it today. History is never like that. You know, when you're asked, what are the lessons of history? What can we learn from the past? So you're tempted to say it's not a morality play, you know. It's something a little more complicated than that. And... Uh, I still think that Kumarappa is fascinating because he was arguing this Gandhian blueprint in terms of its implications for resources. Now, Kumarappa was not without his critics. If one were to look at those who were to shape India's future, many disagreed with him. One of them was the great Meghnath Saha, who wrote extensively 
in the 30s, went on to be a member of parliament, a very important physicist, studied uh, nuclear sciences, has uh, a remarkable work about the rivalry of Meghnath Saha and Baba, which is actually a Calcutta-Bombay rivalry. No prizes for guessing who won and uh, which, which institute got the maximum resources, which is the one in Bombay, not Kolkata. But Meghnath Saha argued that India could not afford the luxury of going down the path which was being sketched out by Komarappa uh, in order to protect national independence. And remember, this is the 1930s. It's an age when militarism of a very open sort, and not that militarism was new to the great European powers or to the United States, but it was coming up in a more brazen and open form, even within Europe and in large parts of Asia and Africa. I'm referring, of course, to the rise of fascist Italy, warlike Japan, and of Nazi Germany. So the ideas of Kumarappa, therefore, are strongly attacked by someone like Saha, where Saha argues that in order to safeguard your national independence, you'd need at least three sinews of a national economy. Note this very emphasis on the sinew, muscle, bone, you know, very interesting. He argued it would be iron and steel, power, and chemical fertilizer. It's very interesting. Look at the three. Iron and steel, power, and chemical fertilizer. And in a sense, this is what was happening in the 1930s. The 1930s, we tend to forget at a time when there were huge transformations happening in two countries which would dominate the late 20th century. One, of course, was the now extinct USSR, the, the Soviet Union, the, the launching of the five-year plans. And uh, there's a remarkable painting, which, like all paintings, is completely inaccurate on one point. The key figure in the painting, who so you'll be happy to know was around five foot one or two. He's shown as a much taller man. I'm sure you've guessed who, uh, Joseph Stalin. So in the, in the painting, he's a much taller figure and he's surrounded by people. And they're all staring at this, at this landscape. It's a model and it's called the Stalin plan for the conquest of nature. It was a plan for the extension of development into areas where they hadn't been developed. This, this transformation of the Soviet Union captures the imagination of many people in the colonized world. Because this was a country industrializing, not through the path taken by the French, the Germans, the British, or the Americans. And I think this is very, very significant. This would play a very important role in capturing the imagination, not just of Meghnath Saha, but of a very great son of this, uh, the former princely state of Mysore, Visveswarai. So when Kumarappa wrote a response to Visveswaraya's book called Industrialize and Perish, it's not a very widely read book, but the title of Visveswaraya's book would be familiar to anyone from the mid-20th century. It was called Industrialize or Perish. This is not an idea. It is not a slogan. It's the spirit of the times. I want to emphasize this very strongly. This is a time when nationalists across the world are dreaming of a world beyond empire. And in that world, their question is, how will we have the economic wherewithal to protect our political sovereignty when we attain it? This would be common to a Jawaharlal Nehru as much as to a Khwane Akhruma. Uh, it would animate in the 1950s the great Arab nationalist Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, when Nasser takes Soviet aid and builds the Aswan Dam, hmm, there have been many changes in Egyptian politics after Nasser. The US today counts Egypt as a reliable ally, which it definitely was not in Nasser's time. But the lake that resulted was named Lake Nasser. That name has not been changed. Because for Egyptians, the building of the Aswan Dam, as much as the expulsion of British troops from the Suez Canal and the nationalized Suez Canal, was a moment when the Egyptian people stand up. And I think there's something very significant in the early, mid-20th century, in these large engineering projects becoming symbols. Today, we are very critical of them. But we know that many of these projects had ill effects. Think of the Nehru era itself. M. Krishnan wrote a remarkable piece on the wildlife of Tunga Bhadra before the dam. And in a lecture many years later, he recounted how the building of the dam, the very process of building, unleashed destruction in this fascinating semi-arid landscape. By the way, Krishnan had argued that if the cheetah were ever introduced or reintroduced, this would have been an ideal landscape. But he also wrote that the building of the reservoir obliterated that landscape. But even in the process of building, uh, Krishnan, drawing from his notes in the 50s, 
showed that, you know, the laborers were not paid enough. Therefore, what they did is they went out with a muzzle loader and they shot a wild boar or a gazelle or hares and ate them up. They were not given alternative fuel, so they went and chopped on wood. And the more enterprising among them not only chopped wood in order to burn, they chopped wood in order to sell. So these transformations of the landscape may not have been intended by those who built these Heidel projects, but these consequences were inbuilt into the way these projects were conceived. You see this much more clearly in the case of displacement of people. Uh, there's a very important event where Jawaharlal Nehru goes to inaugurate the Hirakut Dam. And uh, the dam uh, inauguration had something many of you will be familiar with. When projects are inaugurated in democracy, you have lots of people clapping and you have some demonstrating. There were 100 people who showed up with black flags. And uh, uh, Nehru went and talked to them. We don't have a record of the conversation. What we do have is a record of Sardar Patel's letter to two of the members of the demonstration. They were members of the Legislative Assembly of Odisha. And the letter is fascinating. I will paraphrase. Sardar Patel wrote that the issues that have been raised by the protesters are very important. He pointed out that he was familiar with these issues. He had headed the Ahmedabad municipality. And as head of the municipality, he had had to deal with the issue of displacement of cultivators from a proposed airport. And he said that while the issue is important, the mode of addressing the issue you have chosen is inappropriate. He said it's inappropriate because of who you are. He said up to now, our problem was to raise issues and grievances. Our challenge now is to come up with solutions. And he argued that this dam was as necessary as the airport then, but whoever is displaced must get what I am paraphrasing, a life of material dignity. So he urged these legislators to be disciplined congressmen and to stay aloof from all such demonstrations, but to try and address these issues. And I think this is a very interesting view of what is the role of knowledge in a democracy. Is it to oppose that which is wrong? Yes. Is it also to propose that which may be better? Should that which is better be a substitute? The critics may say that building the dam, building the airport, resettling the people is a substitute. You are not changing the fundamentals of the development paradigm, but you are modifying it in significant ways to minimize the sense of loss of what today would be called entitlement by those who lose out. Let's be very clear that in the India that emerged in the 40s to the 60s and even into today, this is a dilemma or an issue which we were and are and will be grappling with. One reason is, and this is where the history matters, already by the year 1600, India and China were among the largest societies on earth in numerical terms. Today, if one looks at India, the density of population is over 400 to a square kilometer. I can't give you a more exact date because since 1881, there's been a diecennial census and in 2021, there was no census. I want to note that there was a census even in 1941 when Asia, Europe, Africa were embroiled in the Second World War. So unlike China, which started censuses late, India has a tradition of censuses going back. But whichever figures you use, 400 to a square kilometer is a lot of people. It's even more if you halve that. About 46% of the land is cultivable. So if one were to assume that you need to generate food, fiber, meat, wool, and so on, we are looking not at 400 to a square kilometer, but at 800 to a square kilometer. Let me complicate it even more. In 1947, when India became independent, the lifespan of the Indian male, better fed, better endowed than the women, then, as now, I regret, was 32 years. Today, it is 67 or 68 years. So you have a large population which is living longer. It is true, population growth rates have dropped. The near Malthusian fears of 50 years ago have proven groundless. You're still dealing with 1.4 billion people. You want to complicate it more? There's very famous biblical saying, you know, buy bread, not buy bread alone. Hmm? But no one will say that you can live without water. If you look at water, India has less than 4 or 5% of the world's fresh water. So it's actually a very small area of land. It looks very large. India looks very large, but it's a lot of people. And here is the interesting part. In the mid-20th century, nobody would have bet on India, or for that matter, China, or Indonesia, or any of the newly independent African countries emerging in the way they have. Since we are talking about nature 
let me share with you someone who many people may have grown up on as i did you know in the 70s there wasn't much to read on nature and wildlife you inevitably read books by hunters and the hero of many of us because he was translated into virtually all indian languages in the 40s and 50s was colonel jim cobbett jim cobbett was sitting uh, in a machan with lord wavell this comes from wavell's uh, son who wrote a very flattering uh, biography as all sons are apt to and uh, it it was called uh, viceroy's journal he he took refuge behind the fact there were pages and wavell evidently as a very fine uh, officer uh, kept a very detailed diary of all the conversations so they were waiting in the machan the tiger was yet to come and wavell turns to cobbett and say do you think the tiger will survive once we leave it's a very interesting question and cobbett said that he doubted it then wavell asked why he said the tiger would not last more than 10 years because in independent india every indian would have the boat and they would shoot the tigers they would clear the forest and they would transform the entire area into cultivated space i'm paraphrasing it's fascinating for cobbett the end of pax britannica would mean the end of india's wildlife because cobbett one should not forget was also a landlord he was not a privileged white we tend to think of whites as one category go it to jeff ward who has reminded us that cobbett was what is called a domiciled brit you know something very interesting about cobbett he was a bachelor and he remained one and one of the reasons he didn't marry there may have been many maybe no one wanted to marry maybe he didn't want to marry but had he wanted to marry he could not have married a white person who had been born in england in in red britain because he was a domiciled englishman his father grandfather had been born in india the domiciled whites were just one rung above what are called the anglo indian you know when things of hierarchies of caste caste uh, is about rank it's about privilege and it's about privilege based on birth it's division of the laborer not of labor as ambedkar said ambedkar dr ambedkar may be horrified but i i i think he may even been pleased we can apply this to the whites in india wavel was also from titled uh, family he was a uh, case of an englishman who both of whose parents were england from india so the english woman from england would not marry somebody like cobbett and the anglo indians as you know were also very important because they were in the railways they were engineers they had a very important uh, legacy in terms of schooling and education in india and one of the anglo indians had a different view from cobbett he not only stayed on in india for a few years sadly he retired and died alone in england he became a member of the constituent assembly one of the other things he did and did very well is he was curator for the bombay national history society i refer to stanley henley henry prater and prater in 1948 did something no one in asia outside japan had done other than boon song lekagul of thailand he was the first person from asia to write a book of the mammals of that country so when you think of the emergence of india you think of the flag you think of the anthem and you think of various things one of the ways in which nationalism asserts itself is to take the label of nation and pin it believe it or not on animals and birds and in the 1940s two men in bombay wrote books such as these the book of indian birds by dr salim ali and the book of indian animals by stanley henry prater stanley prater of course retired and went off to england and he died alone over there ep gee has a very moving passage on meeting him and uh, saying that he he should never have left you know he should have stayed on in india but obviously he identified himself more with with raj but this book is a very important testimony to the fact that there is a sense of indian nationalism emerging by the 40s and 50s which includes the animals and birds of india you see this very interestingly in the fact that as early as 1952 note the year they set up the indian board for wildlife they're not quite sure who should head it so they ask the maharaja of mysore so this is a new role for the princes the princes are vanishing in terms of political power he didn't know this 17 years later the privy purses would also vanish as would the hunting rights but the new role for princes and landed gentry and people who in many ways identified them such as the author of the other book dr salim ali was to try and play a role in securing the heritage in this case not the heritage of culture the arts uh, learning or of ways of living or dress or lifestyle or food but of natural heritage and the Indian Board for Wildlife also had a vice chairman. So they have a chairman and they have a vice chairman. The vice chairman to me is even more interesting than Prater and Salim Ali. It's a man called Dharam Kumar Singh ji. Dharam Kumar Singh ji was from the princely state of Bhavnagar, which is in Saurashtra. Saurashtra, as the name indicates, is the land of a hundred states. Actually, there are more than hundred. And as has often been said, there were large ones such as Junagadh and Bhavnagar, and there were some which were not larger than a few football fields. 
Dharam Kumar Singh was fascinating. He was packed off at a young age to study in England. And one of the things he did in England was to pick up an English schoolboy's habit, which I think is deplorable, which was to collect birds' eggs. So you picked up a swallow's egg or a duck's egg or a quail's egg. You put a pin and you took out the yolk and you preserved it. But the result is that he became a very accomplished ornithologist. And in the 1940s, he did something remarkable for the new government of Saurashtra, which was reconstituted as one of the Class C states, he conducted a rapid survey of the fauna and flora of Saurashtra. Now there's lots he wrote about the lion and the black buck and the bustard, but I want to share with you something fascinating he wrote. Uh, particularly because so much of today's talk is about trees. He wrote about a hill called Shatrunjaya and a forest which would soon be obliterated for the most part of Acacia tortillus. And he described the honey that was made by the bees from the blossoms of the Acacia tortillus. So he was recording a landscape which was vanishing. Many of these princely states, 100 or whatever number they were, had very avid hunters. The rulers of Bhavnagar imported cheetahs from Africa because Indian cheetahs were already becoming very rare. They trained them to hunt in an area called the Bhal. They let the cheetah go and it captured black buck. And Dharam Kumar Singh in the 40s begins to do something very few people have done in the subcontinent. Salim Ali would do on a larger scale. He started ringing birds. He also put away his gun for the most part and took something even more unusual, the cine camera. And he conducted studies, the first ones, of the courtship of the Florican. I find these men very interesting because what they were trying to do was to broaden the canvas of public life in India by bringing the fauna, the flora, the living treasures of the subcontinent into public eye. Or an aside in the 50s, there's a debate which would actually be settled as late as 1969 on what should be the national bird of India. Dr. Salim Ali had conducted the studies of the bustard, but the real expert was Dharam Kumar Singh. He even gave number estimates of the bustards in the 50s. Now, the bustard, by the way, may well be on the way to extinction now because of power lines being set up through the desert. And unless they put the power lines underneath, they will die out. But interestingly, when Dr. Salim Ali suggested the bustard should be the national bird, there was a very interesting article by M. Krishnan objecting to this, arguing that this would lead to a very unfortunate international incident because a slight misspelling of the bird, B-U-S-T-R-D, <laughs> may lead to widespread embarrassment. On a more serious note, he said that hardly any Indian had seen or would see a bustard. It didn't have a name in most Indian languages. A child could not draw this bird. I find this fascinating. The bird for the new nation should be a bird which children can see and draw. He suggested what I think was a very worthy candidate, the Indian minor. He was overruled. We all know what happened in 1969. They made the peacock the national bird. But I'm sure you'll agree that the peacock meets many of Krishnan's requirements. It's easy to see. Most people are familiar with it. I don't think it has a very melodious voice. There's actually an awful Hindi saying very insulting of animals that a donkey married a peacock. You know, you know this, aapne suna hai? Ek ne kaha, kya so hai? Dusne kya, kya surat hai? So the peacock admired the donkey's face and the donkey admired the peacock's voice. This is very insulting to these animals. I think it's allegorical. But to go back, you know, I think that despite all of these ideas, the world of the 50s and 60s is very much a world where development is seen as priority. And the building of the great hydro projects, the opening up of vast areas with fresh irrigation, new techniques of control of malaria, or new ways of controlling diseases that were rampant, the coming of miracle chemicals. They were miracle chemicals. Prior to racial Carson, DDT was seen as a miracle, as was Aldrin, Dialdrin, and all of these. So I think the 50s and 60s are a time of huge sort of unleashing of economic growth. We don't think of it that way. My distinguished colleague, who's now unfortunately left Ashoka University, Polapre Balakrishna, in a very important book, has shown that the rate of economic growth in the first 50 years of independence was 0.5%. Half of 1%. In the first 15, 20 years of independence, it was 4.1%. Yes, India actually grew. And that growth, of course, emphasized heavy industry, steel mills, dams, coal mines, fertilizer factories, and so on and so forth. I think there is a major change in the late 1960s. This in itself should not surprise us. The late 60s were a time of great political, cultural, social, economic upheaval across the world. Many of the dreams of the post war order was seen as crumbling. In the United States, we see the huge turmoil of 1968, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the Black Power Salute in the Mexico Olympics, the summer of discontent, 
and uh, the exit of the US president who decided not to stand for re-election. Very unusual in American history, Lyndon Johnson, largely because of the fallout of the Vietnam War. In China, there's the great cultural revolution, unusual because it's unleashed by the man who ruled China or own, whose name China was ruled, Mao Zedong, who then told his cadres something no ruler in any country has ever said about his colleagues. He wrote a character poster and said, bombard the headquarters, meaning get rid of them because I will rule in your name. It's a, fast, it's a time of huge doubt. And in India too, there was huge doubt. The political turmoil is well known to you. The Congress party is majority reduced. It lost power in seven states. One of them has never got a national party back, my home state of Tamil Nadu. There was a communist inclusive coalition for the first time in West Bengal and so on and so forth. But what is significant is that in the late 1960s, there's a reset, both in political and economic terms, but also in environmental terms. And I would argue that the late 60s to the end of the 80s sees a remake of political power in India with many patterns you might find somewhat familiar today, a more centralized polity, a more dominant leader, an emphasis on technology for transformation, an idea that we've lost a lot of time and we need to take hard decisions now. One of the dimensions of this, which we sometimes uh, tend to forget is, that in environmental terms, this was a time of deep crisis. There were two successive monsoon failures. India was more dependent than ever before on food imports. And little less than 20 million tons gets imported in two years by a country which doesn't have the foreign exchange to pay for. It's also a time of deep agrarian unrest, not just Naxalbari, but of agrarian unrest and food-related unrest in many parts of the country. So there's a sense that the poor or the underclasses, the sharecroppers, the tenants are not getting their due share. And sometimes their resistance would be met with savage ferocity. I refer only to a village which was well known uh, in Tamil literature and politics, but which is better known to the English reading public now because of the writings of uh, the author Meera Kandasamy, uh, Kirwen Mani, where there was a very major killing of a lot of the laborers who were arguing that they had to be paid better wages and they wanted rights. But one of the very interesting responses to this is the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution's origins, of course, are not so much to alleviate hunger, but to end a period of dependence and over-reliance on wheat imports from a major superpower whose strategic objectives were at times at odds with an India which was trying to carve out its own path. Just to remind ourselves, in the 60s, in the course of the Vietnam War, the US unleashed chemical warfare on a scale never seen before or since by any country fighting another. I want to emphasize in an undeclared war. So something like 10-12% of Vietnam was affected by the defoliants such as Agent Orange. And India was one of the countries which was very outspoken on the need for a peaceful resolution of the Vietnam conflict, including Resolutions such as the one in Lusaka in the non-aligned meeting, which specified that chemical warfare was as serious an ethical challenge as the threat of nuclear fallout in nuclear warfare. I would tend to agree because remember the notion that technology, while transforming lives, leaves an imprint and consequences, not only for future generations in this case of humans, but of non-human creatures as well. Similarly, as early as 1967, when the Indian Prime Minister was the only non-communist leader present at the 50th anniversary celebrations of the revolution in Moscow, the statement said that India and the Soviet Union condemned imperialist aggression against the people of North Vietnam, unquote. This led to a slowdown of food imports. The imports slowed down. The famously, the White House press secretary briefed the press off record under these things, anonymous not to be named. We know it was. Everybody does. But what he said is more important than who he was. It said that the president every night, while picking targets for bombing in North Vietnam, also selects which food shipment to India should go through and not go through. So there was a level of pressure which is very difficult today to comprehend. And paradoxically, the same Green Revolution would be backed by the United States, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the same President Johnson. Johnson is very bad at pronouncing names which are not American. And he told the Indian... Agriculture Minister, the great C. Subramanian, 
he spoke of him he said that subramanian fellow is a very good chap and subramanian was more candid he told dennis cox years later that johnson was like a district collector who thought he was a nawab issuing orders to do things which we were going to do anyway so this access to pesticides chemicals fertilizers high yielding varieties technology cooperation was an indo american project it's a very unusual moment and of course american strategic interests here were geopolitical and social rather than narrowly military the green revolution was seen as an alternative to the red revolution and it's very significant that 20 odd countries which embraced green revolution technology eventually included and believe it or not vietnam unified under communist rule cambodia and laos some of which now have higher rice yields than india so this technology could be harnessed by different nation states for their own ends this had huge consequences which we are all aware of the green revolution of course required large inputs on a smaller area of land for high yielding crops which matured faster and the phosphorus potassium nitrogen stays on in the soil reaches into the water the narrowing of the germplasm base probably is one of the great significance evolutionary turning points certainly in the cultivated spaces this applies not only to the major crops of then wheat and rice but to a range of high yielding varieties now and uh, along with this is the fact that this would widen the disparity between areas which were affected by the green revolution and areas left out and how far would this package work in areas which were arid or semi arid where water was not abundant or in areas where in order to make water abundant you draw down that vast subterranean uh, reservoir of water which had been built up not over decades or centuries but perhaps millennia aligned with the green revolution but the polar opposite of it supposedly was the idea that nature could be preserved by secluding it this is a time of great transformations in the 60s 70s 80s when the area which was protected grew you are in karnataka one of the first tiger reserves here was bandipur and one of the features of history is that when you get the new it often overlays the old the old doesn't disappear it doesn't vanish it resurfaces in new form so the tiger reserves were to have core areas which were a sanctum sanctorum humans were not allowed to roam around on foot it was supposed to have nature running its own course and krishnan uh, always very alert to history pointed out that this is not a new idea he said the venugopal wildlife park 41 square kilometers had been carved out in the bandipur shooting hunting blocks of the maharaja and forestry had been halted there so this is an old idea of certain parts of princely india there were others mysore is just one case which were built into this notion of the tiger reserve here again you see a similar sort of pattern if nature is to be secured in certain areas even if it is to be secured successfully it may have implications and consequences built into its design and one of the implications built in was that not only in princely india but in former british india the older tradition of forestry which assessed the value of the forest in quantifiable terms how much timber does it produce how much revenue does it produce is reinvented in a new way how many tigers are there in that reserve you know you may be seeing lot of criticisms there are now 53 tiger reserves there are 15 reserves which have no tigers yesterday i was reading on one of the problems of google they keep sending you things which you don't ask for them it said jim cobbett reserve has the highest density of tigers in in the world so this quantification of things now not in terms of how many trophies you produce but how many tigers cubs are born and how many are raised how many die has its own implications one of them is of course very evident the tiger and its protection was justified legitimized because it was seen as a symbol of the larger pyramid of life by securing the tiger you secured its forest home or its marshland home or its semi arid home and you secured the pyramid of life or the cycle of life within it but you know something 90% of india doesn't have tigers it can't it's either too dry or too cold or too wet or too hot or whatever second tigers are largely forest animals some grasslands i have news for you much of india is not grassland forest or whatever is tiger habitat so the tiger casts its own shadow on other life forms the forest casts its own shadow on other landscapes where do you see this better than the fact that the protection and conservation of grasslands of semi arid tropes of deserts of marshes of mangroves of wetlands rarely comes into the public space it gets reduced to how much forest is over is there more forest or now 
It's worse if you're a historian who studied forestry. People catch you and say, what tree is that? And you say, you don't know. They say, what's the use of your PhD? You don't even know the meaning of these three trees. But the other implication of both of these, or this kind of development, is of course social. The, 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 the notion of conservation is of nature enclosed, being enclosed by the nation state to preserve it, to protect it, to secure it. But is enclosure a form of preservation or is it a form of extermination? I leave it to you. Can preservation be a form of destruction? Particularly where peoples are displaced, aside from their material dignity and rights, important in itself, do we lose certain critical forms of knowledges? We were just celebrating the orality of telling a story of a tree. Now, one of the great things A.K. Ramanujan said is, when you hear a story as opposed to read it, the teller and the hearer are both part of a process. One of the nice things when you tell a story is people interrupt you and say, I think you got that wrong. Or do you really know what you're talking about? Because they think they know it better than you. And maybe they do. And I think that this is something of enormous significance. Because one of the things which happens in independent India is, and a great positive revolution, many people who never had property got it. You know, we think of women and the Hindu Succession Act. But think of tenant farmers and the great film, you know, I'm sorry I keep going back to Hindi films. But to me, one of the great films which was ever made was Dobi Ghazameen, Balraj Sani, who, you know, he dies at the end of the film. The other would, of course, be Mother India, which if you think about it, is of a farm family headed by a single woman. It's a 21st century film. And of course, it's played by the legendary Nargis. In the case of forests, and I want to emphasize this, the extinguishing of rights which took place in the imperial period not only continued but gathered pace in independent India. Private forests, Zamindari forests, Malgozari forests were also brought under the penumbra of the Forest Act. And it was only as late as 2006 that this began to be corrected. By the end of the century, we were in a different era. The world of the Cold War went away. The Berlin Wall fell down. We'd then been told that liberal democracy has won and the free market has won. The great book written by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. Today, 30 odd years after that, I don't think anybody would say with any certitude that history has come to a full stop. There's a debate on what is liberal, what is a democracy. There's a debate on whether free markets really work. But more importantly, particularly in the post-89 world, the question of human predicament, the human endeavor attaining a better world, cannot be addressed unless one addresses the question of the environment. It's not an issue of the survival of the bustard or the tiger or the forest or the mangrove. It's about modern civilization itself. And many of the presuppositions and premises of that project of industrialization are today widely being questioned. What do we have in its place? Is it a substitute or an alternative? What do we mean by the notion of an alternative? Alternative to what? Alternative for whom? Alternative for how long? I was struck by that parable of the Krishna fig tree. You know, the ficus tree has one very important characteristic. However long humans live, there are people who claim to be 100. There are people who claim to be 120, 160. The tree, if allowed to live, will outlast us. So what happens when you think of longer time spans? And India is an obvious country. Think of longer time spans. We have oral traditions which go back 10, 20, 50 generations. We have traditions of production or livelihood, which also go back a lot. So what can we draw from our past when we think of subcontinental transitions? I'd end with just two points. And here I want to go back to Rachel Carson, who I think is a fascinating person for the way she fused the culture of science and the culture of literature, knowing nature and how it works. For the moment, just, just keeping nature as the non-human. Let's just assume that's it. It isn't, but let's assume it is. But the idea that the way in which you describe it, explain it, tell it, is aesthetically pleasing. And she had a wonderful line in one of her writings. She said, in nature, nothing stands alone. It's such a redolent line. It says, in nature, nothing stands alone. In history, nothing stands alone. When we look at nature and history and the past of the 20th century, what is it that you can extract as some sort of insight into the future? One of them is that one cannot look at human history without looking at the biophysical and the larger environment in which we live. The other is that the consequences of actions live on long beyond the time they are taken. They have both expected and unexpected consequences. And being better informed about this is the least that we can do as we imagine a future which draws from the past, but is markedly not just better, but different from it in a positive way. Thank you.
You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Center. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saruna Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC. Bye.